ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome you on behalf of the Václav Havel Library. I'm also pleased to welcome here our guests, Pavel Fischer and Jiří Schiffler, and the moderator David Vaughan, who is cooperating with us on a long-term basis. And I thank him for this. Uh, for those of you who are here for the first time, I would like to inform you that we organize English events at least once a month. And uh, in April, we will have two English events. Uh, one is English Czech, but it will be uh, translated, interpreted, on the 28th of April, uh, starting at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and it will be um, two panel discussions about Václav Havel's journey to Israel from 1990. And also, the second panel will be about uh, current so relations between Czech Republic and Israel. And there will be also some Israeli guests. We organize it with, in, co sorry, in cooperation with uh, the Embassy of Israel. And I think it will be a nice evening. And the day after, actually, on the 29th of April, we, had, we will welcome uh, Ralph Young from the US, who wrote the book, uh, Listen, The History of an American Idea. So you are invited. and. Uh, I give the floor to David and I wish you a nice evening. Okay, well, welcome, welcome to you all here. Um, it's a nice, not too large a group, so I think we can be fairly informal. I think both our guests will agree that uh, if ever there's a, at any point you feel a, a desire to interrupt us uh, or to ask a question or to, or to make a comment, please don't hesitate to do so. We're an extremely distinguished company. We've got uh, a knight of the Order of the White Elephant sitting on this podium. We've also got a knight of the Order of St. Charles, isn't it? And one is a monaguesque, if that's correct, that it did uh, honor being bestowed on you, and the other is uh, from Thailand. I, I guess that these are just um, standard things that they give to diplomats, are they? Or were, these, or were, you, were you particularly honoured? <laughs> sorry, I promise to start with that. Uh, sorry to start with it. Uh, well, <laughs> I'm the first Czech to get this award from Mas after Masaryk and Benj. So. <laughs> <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> I think that I'm first check, but I have no special uh, research. Uh, Yuzi is a uh, historian, so you will like him. <laughs> <laughs> so the historian in the house, I think there are probably more historians. And, well, as you can probably tell, we've got two career diplomats, but career diplomats who are a great deal more than just being career diplomats here today. Pavel, Fischer was for a good many years, he was the Czech Republic's ambassador to France and Monaco. And he also worked in the president's office. And he was a close, good friend of President Havel, a close associate of President Havel. And what can I add? He's also a musician. He plays violin. I don't know if you still do, I assume you still do. A bit. At Christmas I do. <laughs> and but I sing all the to my enemies. <laughs> That's the ultimate diplomatic weapon. <laughs> and Yuzi Schittler also has a very distinguished diplomatic career. Most recently he was um, ambassador to Romania. Since then, he's been appointed just a few days ago as the Czech Republic's special envoy for Holocaust and anti-Semitism issues. I'm sure that at some stage we'll come to that in the discussion, I expect. And prior to that, he was ambassador in Thailand, Burma, Myanmar, uh, and uh, also Cambodia. And he has also been extremely uh, 
the central figure in Czech German negotiations at the time of the Czech German declaration in the mid 1990s. And he is also, I hope you won't mind if I say this, he's the only person who Václav Havel allowed to write his speeches for him. Although I'm sure that President Havel probably covered in his scribbles after he gave him to him. Yeah, he did. <laughs> so, I'd like to start with, with Václav Havel, because you both knew him personally. And I would like to ask you what, what do you think is missing in the Czech Republic, in a diplomatic sense, with the loss, the death of Václav Havel? Um, I would say maybe two perspectives, uh, just opening the, the, the scope or the... because there are many things we are missing here. Uh, first of all, I think that there are very old questions we Europeans just have forgotten the answers to. And I think that Havel uh, was replying to the quest of sense in Europe in terms which were universal. And by doing so, he was intelligible for uh, many uh, foreigners and people coming from many different continents. Uh, it might be uh, in interesting to share with Yezhi because uh, this is my first time I'm with him in, on stage, his uh, souvenirs and memories from different trips on, on um, various continents. We used to prepare both of us uh, in the closest presidential uh, team. Second thing uh, I would say that is missing today is that uh, uh, we are so uh, inspired by different news and uh, images and social media, online uh, uh, occupations, that we become non-consequent. Uh, we become inactive. And Václav Havel was both consequent and active. And this is something very astonishing. If you read his, uh, his posts from 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, there is still the same line. Uh, if you read back his letters to Olga, and then you take one of the speeches we were supposed to help to deliver with Yezhi, you see the same line. Uh, and this consequence in thinking, and this uh, engagement, he was not inactive, he was active, he was uh, proactive. Often he told us they do not want to be object of uh, his story, I want to become, once again, subject uh, of history. So I think two things uh, are missing, but the list should be. There's one thing you said that it strikes me as quite uh, surprising or quite paradoxical. You said that the, 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 the world of today's media and the internet and these mass communications has made us less active rather than more active. I have to, to admit that I never discussed new media with him. <laughs> uh, so I have no special competence here. Uh, he was at the same time very old-fashioned and at the same time very modern. Uh, he served uh, as one of the rare here, uh, uh, his uh, Mac uh, computer uh, since the uh, very beginning. Uh, so he was very modern in some way, but at the same time uh, very old-fashioned if you read back his uh, handwritten uh, remarks. Uh, or um, orders we received. Uh, I just remember that uh, in the 1990s, when there was like the first, for the first time, they did use like live uh, chats, you know, online, not like a classic interview, but the politician answer all that. He did that too, but it was like a nightmare for him. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, something he didn't feel very. Comfortable. Is this because he was, I mean, he was such a stage manager, wasn't he? He loved yeah. to manage everything. Did he feel it was slightly out of his control? Yeah, and he was not in direct touch with the, also with the interviewer, and he didn't have, uh, but he didn't have also the advantage of uh, having enough time to think it through his answer. So it was, it was, uh, yeah, I think he didn't like it very much actually. But, uh, I, uh, Pavel 
said very well what, was, uh, what we miss now uh, after Ras uh, Alvarez is not here uh, anymore. I mean, that's like in the terms of his intellectual input, but as a Czech diplomat, I have to say we miss a lot as a uh, person who was like a door opener for the Czech Republic. He was an international celebrity after all, and it was uh, easy with him and with his name to achieve uh, things which he kind of uh, uh, supported and we know now that it's like more difficult simply than don't uh, have him. And, uh, like having a president, even a former president, because uh, even when he wasn't the president anymore and Obama uh, visited Prague, it was Obama who wanted to meet Havel and the other way around. And I don't <laughs> think that the, President of a Tamilian nation, I mean, we can achieve that easily. So, and we, so simply, we, it, it was uh, easier in terms of uh, image, the influence, just because he was a celebrity. But you said you talked about him being able to see things in, in, a, in a more universal context, in a broader context. Uh, when I met you last week, you spoke about his ability, about Hubbard's ability to synthesize a lot of many different ideas and to make, uh, to, to, to reach a, a kind of clear conclusion, to express things that we, people might have felt but weren't quite able to articulate. And that currently there's a lot of confusion in Europe, whether it's about European integration, or it's about Greece or Ukraine, um, or about the rise of the far right. Uh, where there are very few politicians who seem to be articulating where, where the core of the problem might be. Uh, is this the sort of thing that you're talking about? Both, uh, two things. I think that Havel, in terms of his personal uh, posture, he was like a sponge. So he was ready to sit and listen to people uh, discussing complex issues three, four hours without stopping, listening, only. This was when he was discuss discussing with you and with other people who were advising uh, to, to be honest, not with me. Uh, uh, he preferred to have interesting people from outside. <laughs> so uh, I was too boring for him. But our method was that we sit down with people who should be invited and we try to bring back the message to the house from outside. But his, uh, uh, his uh, favorite format was Amalia discussions. It lasts four, five, six hours. Imagine this time. Uh, outside of Prague in a remote area, uh, which is in a presidential uh, close garden or forest house. And uh, he was listening there very distinguished uh, guests, sometimes very controversial guests. And at the very end of the, of the even, uh, evening of such a debate, sometimes very, uh, very spicy, he took the floor and he said maybe three sentences, resuming all. And at the end of the day, he succeeded to accommodate all the differences, major differences, in a unique perspective. And this is a quality uh, he uh, uh, was extremely uh, useful for the whole uh, life of dissidents here in the 70s and 60s. Uh, but second point, I would say that he apprehended the reality not by the prism of a university professor or a philosopher, but as an artist. So he was very much curious to observe minor things. Uh, characters or messages or dialogues. So at the end of the day, uh, it was very funny to work with him because you never knew by which end he should start next time. Well, when you said he was cut all these people he was talking to, were there, were there some people, were there people that he, you knew that he deeply disagreed with as well? I mean, was he trying to get a synthesis of opinions with, from across the spectrum? I suppose that's one of the great mistakes that a lot of uh, statesmen statesmen are made, isn't it, that they tend to surround themselves by people who like thinking people and then they suddenly get a shock when they, when they encounter the outside world. When I was appointed director of his political staff, this was my ambition, to, to maintain the flame of opposition 
inside of the OPS uh, uh, strong enough. In terms of having a challenger in house that we have really to clarify thoughts before it comes uh, to be public. And the same during different debates. Uh, I think that it is not a declaration of, uh, of a superman because uh, he was also fragile and uh, he, for instance, didn't know how to reply to people who were um, behaving in a, with disrespect or with force, for instance. There he became just cautious. And, uh, but, but he definitely didn't invite to these meetings people who were disrespectful, but he invited people who disagreed with him and who were able to do it in a, a proper way. And these meetings, which uh, Pablo mentioned, they were uh, these Amaya meetings, they always focused on a certain issue. So the evening, the evening was dedicated to Germany, there would be invited people from left to right and intellectuals and even writers and who were like somehow knowledge about Germany or, or about you know, discussions about architecture or uh, about relations to Israel, whatever. It, it was not necessarily uh, only like highly political issues, but it could be also like, cultural, intellectual topics. You talk about him as an artist, as of synthesizing these ideas. Also, there was, there, there was something uh, uh, of the, the spiritual side of, of uh, Havel, wasn't there? Although he was an ag agnostic. Um, he seemed very much at home in thinking of his friendship with the Dalai Lama, for example. Did that sort of manifest itself in his, in his let's say, you know, everyday diplomatic existence? I would say certainly so, because uh, I think whatever he did, he did in a way you could feel it, like subspecie eternitatis, or how to put it in, you know, these words. I, I think in Greek, I don't know how to describe it, but that he was a person who didn't think in like, I don't know, in like electoral periods, that's for sure. One day I tried to make a research on how he speaks about God. And it's very interesting. Uh, I made even an article about in French, unfortunately, uh, about this quest of. Uh, of the other, of thou, of you, the other. And he calls him every time in a different way. So this is a relationship which is not fixed on the stone, which is not easy to be identified with one single religion. Uh, it is a quest of understanding my own place in the world and my own responsibility. By the way, the renewal of responsibility as a response to a call was one of the very strong themes in his writings. And when you talk about his dislike of impoliteness or of, of violence or the threat of violence, how do you think he would have uh, reacted and coped with the current crisis, conflict between Russia and, and Ukraine and with the with the, the bullying tactics, tactics that have been used by, by uh, President Putin. I remember that when he was asked about Russia, he said, you know, this is a country that doesn't know where it ends. <laughs> and unfortunately, uh, his uh, perspective or his remark uh, is much more concrete than we should admit at that time. And. Uh, Yes, he had a strong admiration to Russian culture, to Russian thinkers, and all this tradition of spiritual and artistic life. But at the <laughs> same time, uh, he uh, was very keen to speak about those people who come nicely dressed, who speak nicely German or English, and were immediately accepted uh, on the same uh, level as uh, democratic leaders. And I think that uh, he spoke about one concrete person, but I think that he was also speaking about different cases. By the way, when he speaks about Ukraine, it was maybe 10 years ago, uh, his statement was 
Rust here projected a, a, a dox uh, debate, and it was just astonishing because it was still very fresh, and you can just make a copy paste. This is still uh, the message. He said first. It's up to Ukrainians <coughs> to decide their future. This is not my role to help them to understand their place. And uh, second, we have to support them if they uh, make a choice of European integration. But I am not, uh, my quote is not to do that. Sorry. Mm -hmm. What do I have to do? Well, uh, I think for, uh, I don't know what he would have done and said today. It's uh, well, hypothetical, but. Uh, he was uh, always uh, very much, uh, not determined, but he was uh, always writing and uh, thinking and reflecting very much on this Nietzsche Munich experience. It was like an issue which comes back in his like, uh, articles and... and uh, you have to explain a bit more what you mean by that. Mm -hmm. I think you have to explain a little bit more what you mean by that. Uh, the, the, uh, the Munich... The, the well, okay, the, of course, 1930. Uh, eight uh, Munich uh, <coughs> conference and the, the uh, appeasement towards uh, towards uh, Nazi Germany at that time. So this kind of a, uh, like conferences about uh, let's say nations which are not part of them <laughs> and uh, appeasing uh, evil dictators. It was a very uh, Strong thing, uh, theme uh, for him all the time. But it's also so, complex, isn't it? It's also the Czech complex. Of course, of course. Of course. Of course. Which uh, might also, there's always a danger as well as it might distort the way that state mm -hmm. and diplomats see today's mm -hmm. diplomatic problems. Mm -hmm. there, there's a flip side of it. Well, yeah, but it's there. It's here. I think if you, I remember, I have read uh, a couple of years ago, like some kind of a uh, opinion poll, uh, people were asked what the biggest disaster in the Czech history, and that was like the, the, I don't know, the highlight of the Czech history. The biggest disaster was Munich, even for the generation of today. So, uh, in, 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 in the poll, and, and, so, and if interesting. That's, if that's the case, then, um, nobody, very few Czechs would sympathize with Chamberlain in his position as you know, British Prime Minister making, ultimately this is what, what history proved to be an unwise decision to sacrifice Czechoslovakia to, to, to Germany. Uh, if that's, if, if, if that, that is so central to, to, to Czech consciousness today, why is it that uh, there's more support for Ukraine among the Czech public? You'd, you'd assume on the logic of what you were saying that people would, uh, when there's a, a, a neighboring country, which part of which has been annexed by another, um, in another part of which troops are in some way involved, you would imagine there would be a gut reaction that, oh, this is something that we don't agree with, but it's much more complicated, isn't it? The public opinion seems to show something, or opinion polls seem to show something rather more, more different. Yeah, I will speak maybe first, because Yuri is still at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, so what do you think? <laughs> The advantage maybe to take the floor uh, because it's uh, maybe sensitive. Uh, I would say that your question is uh, completely appropriate, and I think that uh, we cannot dissociate our own experience and our, our own complex and our own unhappiness with something that, have, uh, that, that is happening uh, currently in our neighborhood. And Back to Havel and his uh, thinking. Uh, in different places he said, you know, if you identify an evil close to you, to your country, you have to uh, take the decision, step up, face it and challenge it. And in some way, uh, he was trying to, uh, to finish the dissociation principle on one hand and of power on the other hand. And this is the reason he was so admired uh, uh, worldwide. The other day I was in Seoul in my previous incarnation and I was asked by the officials about some issue which was uh, uh, at the top of the agenda. And I very smoothly 
uh, describe probably the position of our country. And they just took a while of reflection and then and they said, okay, we understand. You and Václav Havel, this is clear in our four arts, why you are so principle-based uh, in this uh, situation. So it gave us a lot of freedom because uh, it was also a visibility of our country and a long time afterwards he stepped down um, uh, we have this heritage with us. So it is something that we should maybe be aware of much more than, uh, than we are paying attention. I presume that his legacy is still around, even that one of them, at least one of you, is still at the foreign ministry. So. Despite working in the foreign ministry, I would like to comment on it anyway. <laughs> um, uh, I might not have the right feeling here for the public opinion in the Czech Republic because I have spent the last four years in Romania. Uh, came back like actually a couple of weeks ago, so I'm not uh, well, it's already two months. And so, um, but definitely compared to Romania, where uh, like from the left to the right, you know, they have very uh, clear opinion about the situation and Putin is a danger, Russia is a uh, danger, and uh, they have no doubt about it. So, compared with that, uh, maybe, maybe and compared with Poland, maybe the public opinion here may be more split than, than that, but still, uh, when, I, when I read the opinion polls, I don't know if I read the same ones, but, but so it made an impression to me that actually the number of people who uh, are critical about the Russian policy is much higher than it looks from the, you know, uh, from the media. So I think it's a little bit, uh, they, have, they are a little bit overrepresented in the, uh, in the media. It doesn't necessarily reflect the real situation in the crowd. I think we could see it also uh, on the, uh, now when the, when the NATO convoy, when the total failure of, the, of, the, of their attempts to organize protests. So, uh, I, but it's, it's just my impressions, but I have to admit I don't have the, after four years spent uh, abroad, I might not have the right feeling of the situation. But it is interesting that the Czech Republic, the Czech Republic, Slovakia and Hungary, three countries that have experience of having been occupied mm -hmm. by the Soviet Union within the last 50 years. Uh, there is a quite a strong mm -hmm. um, view, let's say sympathy at least, It's not my impression, but I think there are, there are I mean, these uh, kind of like groups are overrepresented maybe in the public discussion in media and uh, I'm sure they represent uh, the, the public opinion, but it might be the same. So let's ask about the question of, of ethics and diplomacy generally, because you know I think that um, there are some people, like Henry Kissinger for example, who said you know, that, that there's nothing more dangerous than putting too much ethics into diplomacy because you start making mistakes. Mm -hmm. You can point to some of the mistakes made by maybe the President Bush or, or the current US President or where, where, you're, where, you, where you're driven by ethics at the expense of pragmatism, let's say. Is that, did, would you agree that there is a danger of putting <coughs> too, much, too much emphasis on, let's say, the ethics of foreign policy? or as you perceive it in your in, in, in given country. I think that it is very interesting to read the writings of Václav Havel by the prism of uh, a reader in a comfort situation of, of uh, 2015 we are currently here. And there is several interesting uh, observations to make. First of all, very early he becomes keen about the importance of a, a public or political debate in his own uh, society. So he's mature very quickly uh, as a writer. Uh, and there is this strange continuity that you start to observe in his texts, which is not interrupted by prison, by release from the prison. 
It is even not interrupted by the fall of Berlin Wall. This is still the same story. The same story line. The, uh, the same story line. There is one day in which you see the rapture or the, 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 the disruption or discontinuity maybe. And this is the, the uh, when his wife Olga uh, passed away. It was something very strong. You can even see in his writings. Uh, uh, he speaks about death and hope that goes beyond and challenge the death. The death. It was extremely powerful uh, a speech he wrote for Hiroshima Peace Conference, which was called Future of Hope, in which he apprehended the, the end of life with a light of, of hope. He didn't speak like a Christian or Buddhist, but like a human being trying to understand and to imagine the, the life afterwards. That makes still sense. So I think that this continuity uh, helps us to understand that even in, if he was a politician, he was aware of this uh, uh, tension between day-to-day -day political practice and the importance of, uh, uh, of uh, um, uh, yeah, uh, of transcendent. some uh, of a transcendent. So I think that he tried to conceal it, and he suffered from this because there was a tension. Necessary. Well, uh, I think that there are situations when, uh, let's say, pragmatic and uh, ethic uh, policy or foreign policy or any policy can kind of cross or contradict each other, but. Uh, Against God, these situations are not uh, like very common. I think in most cases, uh, you simply represent a certain uh, interest which is ethically neutral. But as a diplomat, you are paid by your taxpayers to represent the interests of the citizens of your uh, country, and it's. Uh, something ethically neutral, some nothing wrong and uh, nothing kind of particularly ethically good. It's, I mean, ethically it's important you do that because it's what you have uh, paid for. And um, I don't know, uh, I, have, uh, in, I worked as a, for a certain time in the foreign ministry as a chief negotiator of Germany for compensation of uh, Nazi victims. So uh, what's uh, ethical there. If we waive our claims and uh, say that we everything is uh, forgotten and forgiven and we don't demand anything, okay, it sounds nice, but then you have uh, your citizens which spend some time in concentration camps and they don't get any money, so it uh, might be ethical vis-a-vis -vis your international partner and it uh, might be a very nice gesture, but it's not very nice to your own citizens who suffered in concentration camps. So it's like, I think it's, you just fight for them, you get whatever you, you can, and I don't think it's, uh, it's uh, something... Uh, uh, you might find yourself ethically at, at, at odds with uh, your own citizens as well as at a certain point, might you, as a diplomat, if you, if you find yourself in a position where you have to disagree with the majority in your country, then you uh, yes, uh, of course, it, it uh, might be the case, but then it needs to be somehow uh, balanced. I don't know. I, I, I mean, uh, we, we, we would need to discuss a, you know, a specific uh, situation. But for instance, one of the issues which is being discussed is like uh, it's like always economic uh, interest and economic diplomacy vis-à-vis -vis, uh, human. Rights and the majority of your population would say economic interest is more important. My answer would be it's a totally artificial problem. Our trade with China was never so great as in the time when we received Dalai Lama here. There was absolutely nothing. We didn't affect our trade at all. So it's totally, absolutely artificial uh, issue. So which is. Uh, Check check discussion, but it's, there's no real. I don't entirely see why it's artificial, for example, because I mean, if I take the example in my own native country of Britain, if you 
fitted glass of water in London. The water supplier is a Chinese company. Mm -hmm. You are subsidizing the Chinese government, in a sense, by just drinking a glass of water in, in, in London. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there is a, a, there, there is a, a, a certain <coughs> ethical tension there. Well, I'm not, uh, yeah, drinking, what, what kind of water I'm drinking? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, uh, well, uh, <laughs> yes, uh, there's always a question in which case the, uh, because you talk, are you implying like economic Sanctions vis-à-vis uh, -vis dictatorships because this is a uh, this is basically about it. If we bring their water and don't bring their water, it involves uh, sanctions on the well, parts of the. It's not even that far, but having maybe a certain sense of reserve towards a country about which we have considerable misgivings in terms of its human rights level, uh, in terms of, of uh, to what extent, for example, yeah, but, but they, they, they get control of the resources. But as a representative of the government. You either uh, ban the imports or not, but you can't say to your citizen if he drinks the water if it's legally imported. It's just to the citizen and it's his ethics. It doesn't have anything to do with the governmental uh, policy. Uh, then, uh, again, when I was uh, ambassador to uh, Thailand and uh, Burma, uh, there were like two cases and some kind of sanctions were discussed and the case of Burma was very clear and very obvious uh, for me because there was a very brutal government uh, oppressing its own uh, people and uh, whatever resources they had uh, they, they uh, used uh, for the oppression of the people and there was uh, actually absolutely nothing what could, what, what, there was no benefit for the general, uh, general uh, public in Burma from any trade, you know, with, with uh, Western you know, that nations. Before, yeah. before the, the, well, at least the slight um, melting of... <laughs> oh, yeah, yes. Well, it didn't get much better, I'm afraid. It's only a fessy. I'd like to ask you about, because you've met uh, on San Suu Kyi, haven't you? Uh, you yes, 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 uh, yes. But it was, actually, I wasn't an ambassador there anymore. She was released from under uh, house arrest, and uh, actually, I could also see the uh, result uh, of the uh, you know of the government oppression right there, because uh, the Burma and North Korea were the only countries where mobile phones didn't work. So uh, I was showing her how a smartphone looks and what you can do with it. And photos and all these things. <laughs> she was very curious about it. Uh, and uh, as I said, Burma and North Korea was like the, the only two countries I know that actually didn't work. In China at least it works. You know, never know where is your messages, but at least it works. Uh, but in China, for instance, I'm not so sure if it's uh, the case because in, in uh, China, Despite of it being an uh, authoritarian regime, you can see uh, undeniably in the last 25 years the uh, economic development there and also that uh, actually ordinary people benefit uh, from it. It's time to compare China from 1980s and, and uh, today, so I'm not so sure if uh, economic sanctions, uh, of course, we forget that. How to impose them? We're not, like we're, like we're, we're not, not going to talk about economic sanctions then, but if you talk about, for example, a, a, a gesture, you mentioned that one of the strong points of Czech diplomacy has been this ethical aspect, mm -hmm. which is part of Pavel's legacy. There are certain decisions that can be taken, for example, whether or not to meet the Dalai Lama, which could have potential economic But they didn't. Oh, that's my point. This, uh, that's why I think that the debate is, is uh, uh, 
artificial because there is no, absolutely no proof that it has ever had any impact uh, on, on the uh, trade relations. So it was a. Do you like to add something? Yes, uh, uh, this, uh, this debate was uh, uh, ongoing during the uh, uh, term many, many times uh, because he was recalled by governmental officials that he should be maybe more respectful concerning the situation in different countries and promote economic uh, relationship. And he said, you know, I will do my best to promote ship enterprises, but I fear that they are not competitive enough. Um, uh, and uh, while we speak about human rights, we have to be aware of, of the perception, for instance, a big country has of us. If you have an elephant, and this is an example used by Van Havel, if you have, if you imagine an elephant who is challenged by a small mouse, Czech Republic is the small mouse, uh, the elephant looks amazed, maybe with some interest, and maybe he finished by respecting the tiny little voice the mouse is uh, addressing to him. So this was the, the point of Atsavada. This was not ignoring our um, scale in which we could address global issues, but to have a voice to say our purpose, our message, to share this responsibility and to be respected because we stick to the principles. And sticking to principles means that you do not change your posture or your opinion only because there is a, a hope of developing some, of, of having some big contracts. This was his long-term uh, perspective. And if you observe, for instance, some um, countries in, uh, that, uh, that Italy knows better than I, they are operating in very long-term perspective. So I think that we can have interest to stick to some principles. I mean, I'd like to ask you, with your long experience in France, about um, how you uh, perceived the, the, uh, the events that followed the Charlie Hebdo killings and the, the, the moment of general, let's say, shock horror of what had happened that seemed to bring people together. And then the subsequent debate, debates, which don't really seem to have gone anywhere. Um, is it a debate about secularism? I think that if we change the scope and see what happened uh, in, in France in January, where the freedom of expression was challenged by guns, and I think that if you reply to a challenge which is growing by other means than by a pen and you take a gun to, uh, to, um, uh, to reply, this is in civilizational terms a very serious situation. Second, people were just afraid, uh, not as lecturers of Charlie Hebdo, which was not the most popular and cherished uh, weekly, uh, very far from this. But people were uh, just felt threatened by this eruption of violence in public space. And if you see public buildings in France, you observe three big values. Liberté, égalité, fraternité. And by usual political means, you address Liberté, égalité. But address fraternité is very tricky. And the big manifestation that took place after this shooting was about fraternity, brotherhood. And this was a very strong message uh, that uh, people were just touching uh, in this fear, uh, also a lot of hope that this uh, uh, void space. Uh, behind fraternity brotherhood has a very concrete expression. But if you wish to discuss this issue further on, 
I have to alert you or prevent you that there are maybe ten layers of uh, uh, of uh, reasons why it erupted with so much of violence and only very light uh, would be about religion. I think that there are many explanations that are simply linked to other issues. Which is it? Situation in Middle East, uh, failing states in Middle East, and, and situation in Iraq and Syria, in which uh, the traditional administration was replaced by violence and by a, by a, a very strong uh, violence, which was designed as a religious one, but which was not religious, firstly. Very um, uh, difficult situation in protecting uh, freedom from religion. In the United States, you have freedom of religions, but in France, you have freedom from religion. And the public space is challenged by many people who are un unhappy with this. For uh, you will have a social situation in suburbs when you have a very high rate of unemployment. <coughs> Young people, first of all. Five, we will see a situation in police. You simply do not have enough of people in police. Six, you will observe situation in judiciary because judiciary is not uh, supported enough in addressing the cr criminality in, in sharp terms. Seven, you will have surpopulation in uh, prisons when you have sometimes. Uh, 100 of, of, of prisoners to one single personnel from the prison. Eight, you will see the situation of uh, preachers who are often not speaking French and who are paid by foreign countries. Nine, uh, you will meet uh, certainly uh, um, a, a situation of uh, loose of footprint of middle class in France who is more and more uh, inclined to vote extremists. And ten, uh, maybe some civilizational issue at the end. What happens if we observe young people who do not have sense for life and they find a sense for death? This is something that escapes completely uh, traditional tools we have in our societies uh, in which we do not simply refer to a God, but there is something that we have to address altogether. And in terms of, of coming back to the question of ethics and, and say the, the kind of ethics that we're talking about when we're talking about France of Hala and the Czech Republic, uh, and this, and then the huge number of people in the world, in the Middle East, in, in Russia, and any other, in France, etc., who feel in some way disinherited, who feel in some way that the state has let them down. It's very difficult, isn't it, to engage with, and it must be the same in the Far East as well, where you respect the country, to engage with ordinary people who feel, feel like they've been let down by the state. Uh, when you're just talking about democratic values, surely the actuals of having a chance to, to realize your life in some way, to have some kind of ambition, some kind of hope, light at the end of the tunnel, is, is actually the, 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 the more fundamental psychological need. There is a, one funny anecdote I would like to share with you. Uh, both of, the, of us, we helped to prepare some trips or some journeys of us uh, And I remember well, when you prepare such a meeting, gathering with security forces and, and uh, officials and where photographers should uh, be placed and, and what is the timing. I remember uh, an event which was minor but very touchy for, for, for me. We were visiting a, a, a town in pro of province here and everything was according to the schedule, so which was a rather miracle because um, it is uh, rarely so. Everything was under control. And then you have a group of gypsies, Roma people,
there in this uh, town. And uh, I was just alerted what would happen and they were only shouting to their president in terms of, hey, Vashku, welcome. <laughs> and if you call someone Vashku, it means that he's, you are very familiar with him. And this is something that uh, we uh, try to forget because we have Vatsavada in this pure style of, uh, of men, of, of, of statesmen. But he was very close to prisoners. And when he was in prison, he had to deal with the people without high, higher education. By, by the way, himself uh, was not allowed to make university studies. And he had a dream about studying. So he was worker. He was close to uh, excluded people on the, on the margins. So at the end of the day, his, his message was uh, close to very concrete uh, experience. They couldn't talk to each other. <laughs> <laughs> you have to develop it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think it's such a deep thought, but it's, the, the, it's a fact. <laughs> know how to interact with them. It was very awkward. He treated the children as adults. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's very interesting because even small kids felt uh, empowered by this, uh, yeah. this man. I would like to come back what you, you have said about this, uh, I mean, uh, what people want on the basic uh, level, let's say, also in the Far East, and actually those people who want to live, not those who want to die, you know, who are fascinated by death, but they actually, their desires are not so different from ours. They might not want the uh, democracy in the sense of, uh, they might not have the clear idea about the, uh, how the system works, but what they definitely want on a very basic level is a rule of law, uh, because they need to be sure that nobody steals their Field that the courts decides justly if they are not uh, treated well. So it is the things which are, I think, very basic. So I wouldn't, uh, in that sense, see big difference, you know, from us and. Yes, but when, for example, one of the changes in, in Crimea since um, since Russia, Russia annexed mm -hmm. the peninsula is that people have had to start paying taxes. Mm -hmm. Which they didn't have to. The 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 the, 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 mechan the machinery for making people pay taxes wasn't working for them. And now, under the the, the, the heavy rule of, of, of Russia, order things like taxation are beginning to work. And um, you can see that that's appealing to people. Those people are doing it happily, paying taxes. I would suspect that possibly they are. If they, if they probably, if they feel that someone is going to come back to them. It's okay, I, I do that, I'm not happy. Because I'm just wondering, because what you're talking, because you're talking about the rule of law, etc. And of course, that's sort of, there's always a tension, isn't there, between order and freedom. I mean, the hammer, it's, I mean, it's all over his writings, isn't it? This tension between order and freedom. But the rule of law. There was always a bit of the anarchist in Havel trying to sort of undermine the, the rule of law. But the rule of law, law and order are not necessarily the same. Uh, things, you know, if you have a rule of law, you have order. But if you have order, it doesn't mean you have a rule of law. And uh, so in dictatorships, you have very often a order, but you definitely don't have a rule of law. So uh, I, I was going to understand the appeal. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that uh, people really don't want order without the rule of law. I think that, uh, that uh, that's, I, I can't imagine actually people who really want that. They might, they might somehow uh, adapt to it, mm -hmm. but that's not what they really want. Is that right? universal in your experience? I think so, yes. I mean, I, I don't see their difference from between a Chinese and Burmese and a Czech or a American. It's your, I mean, uh, you have a, your family, you have your property, and you want it to be uh, protected. You don't want you know, anybody to come and take it away, and you don't have any way how to defend it, you know, I mean, any legal means. Well, but there are other things you could say about the universal in your diplomacy. 
and this is impossible. So if you've come across either of you, if you've come across a complete, if that's a universal value that you have come across across the board, that you know, the, you, what, what, you, what, where, where is the dispersion of happiness in the <laughs> US? <laughs> <laughs> you know, kind of that. It's, that's for sure. I don't know how, uh, how much this people who want to die, I will call it more like a sense for that, how much uh, they are happy, they want to be happy, so but they, they are the problem. And there's one big subject that we haven't really touched, touched on at all, which is the role of history in diplomacy. You're a historian and you've been exposed to history in many different <laughs> forms as well. And for example, you already hinted at the difference, the different historical experience between, for example, France and, and the United States. So the, friend, the, whole, the whole way France works is, is protecting you against religion, for example, uh, whereas in Britain or the United States it's quite the opposite. So, you know, as, as you pointed out, it's all people give, giving people freedom of religion is far more fundamental. Um, how what extent is, is a knowledge of history a kind of an advantage in diplomacy, and to what extent is it actually a, a, a hindrance? I think that, first of all, you have not to reproduce old mistakes and find old battles. This is a very dangerous not only for diplomats, but also for soldiers, militaries, and others, and politicians, by the way. But uh, second, uh, I, I will have a question to Yuzi, if I can. You are a historian. How many historians work around Bad Salhava? Because it's interesting to observe how many you were. Uh, maybe you didn't work there in order to reproduce history, but to pay special attention to history and to highlight historical moments or places in the agenda of the president. How you would define the role of historians working with the, with the head of state. It's true when you say that, I was like, um, like many of us actually, also for a long time, the director of the foreign policy department was a historian, and I was a historian, Yuri Kutana, Mered Kunchka, there are many, many of us over there, so actually, yeah, the February foreign ambassador in, in uh, Rome. Yeah, um, well, um, regarding history, uh, before I answer your uh, question, I have a friend in the German uh, Foreign Office, he likes black humor, and he says it's very useful to know history and to have a, like a deep knowledge of the, some other nation's history, because then you can uh, learn their weak points and you can hit, hit them hard <laughs> when it hurts, very hurts. <laughs> But he was joking. Uh, uh, you can use it also uh, the other way around uh, to to uh, know the sensitive points of the other side uh, to avoid uh, this kind of uh, this kind of uh, hitting of the weak uh, points. And I think it was rather the pro of historians. <laughs> Uh, Havel's office. And, uh, but having said that, uh, uh, in my uh, opinion, of, I like a quote from the Old uh, Testament which says that you have to you bear the sins of your uh, parents to the third and fourth uh, generation. Uh, I think uh, for also for very practical reasons, it's a very good definition or uh, a very good guide how deep you should go in the history. Because, I mean, you can take into account uh, uh, things which were like maybe uh, defining or, or frustrating or, or problematic uh, for your grandfather, the great grandfather, but if you go before that, uh, you are already creating uh, the problem. I think this is not legitimate anymore. Which is which is absolutely central to your to, to, to the work that you've done. Yeah. Both on in the, the 
there are decisions over the Czech-German declaration, Czech-German relations, and also the question of, of compensation, yeah. restitution for, for uh, victims and survivors of the Holocaust. Uh, where at this stage, we're actually getting close aren't we, yes. to that third generation where there are going to be no survivors left. So it was the last chance actually to do something about it. Uh, but uh, also, I don't think that uh, uh, the next generation after us will have any, let's say, moral right to demand anything for this particular it's period of time from Germany. So I, I think that's, uh, that's also uh, uh, somehow, yeah, I, I believe in this three or four generations. Because it implies that there is such a thing as collect uh, there's collective guilt, so not so much as inherited guilt form. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, when Helmut Kohl famously talked about the the uh, Gnade der Spätern Geburt, the, the, the fact that if you're born after the war, you're spared the guilt, you're suggesting that he's not quite right. Uh, yes, I actually think that there is something like inherited uh, guilt, but not, not of course in the legal sense, but in a Moral sense. Because historical memories go back a great deal further than that. If you look at Ireland, you know, people say, remember 1688 or whatever, and it's as if it yesterday. So it's not, uh, it's not as if historical memories don't go back further than this for generation. I think we should learn to get over what happened, you know, before the time of our grandfathers. But we're always dealing with the legacy. Creating, recreating the problem. But if you're, I mean, if you're, Black in America living in a dis disadvantaged neighborhood, you're still living with the legacy of that uh, historical discrimination. Yes, but uh, I think that you don't have to go back to the 19th <coughs> century. It's enough. Uh, I mean, it was until 1960s, and uh, uh, I mean, before the civil rights movements, but the blacks were actually uh, excluded. So I don't think that it's uh, only like a heritage of the 19th. It was all the heritage of the 19th century, and I would say yes, to so that. Yeah. Can I, can I interrupt? Yes. I, I found out the other day the only embassy that sent condolences to uh, the Germans on the death of their Führer in 1945 was the Irish. Our, our enemy's enemy, you know. Our, yeah. <laughs> but, but can I also go on? To, 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 very interesting what you're saying, and you speak about historians. But there is a larger point, isn't it? And the whole culture and the diplomatic corps in Czech must have changed dramatically. There was a, a call, wasn't there, for new diplomats. And suddenly, from all other walks of life, people came into, uh, you know, what must have been, you must have created a new service, mustn't you, in, in two or three years? Is, is that a, a, a correct impression? Well, there's so many interesting people yeah. in the Czech Foreign Office. Oh, uh, uh, at that time, it was easy to get in. Uh, because if you spoke foreign languages, you had some experience with, uh, like, uh, some international experience. If you were not a communist, then it was like kind of a yeah. There was not so many people so <laughs> like that, so it was it was uh, easy. So we were like kind of lucky at that time uh, to to be in the right time uh, in, the, in, the, in the right place. But I think this kind of a revolutionary period uh, lasted, I would say, until 1997 plus minus, because at that time it was uh, the Diplomatic Academy was founded, so it was like, like a proper way how to get into the uh, ministry, and then, then there was like a, 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 we call it Karierita, career order, yes, or, 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 yeah, yeah, how, or how you proceed, you know. Um, or how you uh, rise, uh, how you climb the ranks, you know. Uh, so it was like, uh, I, I think after that, the revolutionary period uh, ended. But occasionally, the new, uh, but it doesn't have anything to do with the, with the change of the system anymore, but occasionally, new governments decide not to respect so much the career of the, the diplomatic academy. Another, another topics. The, the interesting is to this, there were all these people who came with Hauga, uh, and I mean, one of the defining features of, of, of 
Vasa Klaus was anti Havel, and it is to this day. It must have been, and I expect you won't be able to answer this question, but since you're still working with the Foreign Office, but uh, it must have been very difficult serving under Mr. Klaus. Well, of course, you're not serving, but uh, Mr. Klaus was serving under the, 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 foreign, the Foreign Minister, but serving with Mr. Klaus as President in the wake of the, the years of Havel. Uh, not so much, uh, with some exceptions. Not, not, it is not so tough because we are not in a presidential system and the role of the Prime Minister is very important. The role of the government is uh, maybe in a daily business primordial. Um, by constitution, yes, it is president who represents the state, but the daily business is done by the government. And if you are lucky enough as diplomat, you have a strong voice of opposition in the parliament. And then you have several cards to play with. You explain the official position of your president, of the head of state. Then you can make a point about the governmental uh, doings. And to make a background uh, picture afterwards, you can speak briefly about parliament. So I think that there are ways uh, how to tackle this issue, even though, in a very personal way, yes, you might be seen with a special eye by the, uh, the coming head of state. Sure. No, I, I want to say that, that uh, despite, let's see, this uh, kind of less controversies between uh, Havel and uh, Klaus, uh, they were also able to cooperate. And I think in the 90s it was not, not like so antagonistic as it, as it uh, uh, looks. And uh, Klaus, uh, I think, um, uh, yeah, things about him, but I think he, he was able to appreciate uh, competence. So he might not want Havel's people to be around in the close vicinity, let's say, here, or that the country is very terrible often, but if he considered the person to be competent, he wouldn't uh, block, you know, the nomination for, uh, for uh, other countries. Uh, well, he didn't, he didn't uh, sign my nomination for Vienna and Warsaw, but he didn't have a problem with Eucharist. <laughs> no, I, I mean, it's a very interesting uh, country. I, I like my time there. Do you think that actually, I mean, in terms of Romania, I mean, you think there's a lot of misunderstanding? Mean, Romania seems like, it, from the point of view of France, seems it, it's an extraordinarily little known country, wouldn't it? It's not very far away. Mm. Uh, I think there's a lot of uh, stereotypes people have. People tend to look down uh, on Romania, and I think it's not justified. Uh, it's a very dynamic uh, country. You can see their entry into the European Union like on every uh, step. And uh, the most important thing is they are kind of going up, you know, and you, you can feel it. It, so, and uh, young people speak uh, many languages. But what about the other things you've been talking about, the sort of the rule of law or the you know, functioning of democracy? Do you feel optimistic in Romania? Oh, uh, it is a problem, uh, but uh, again, it's going in the right direction. I, I think you, have, you could see uh, in the last uh, couple of years very you know high-profile processes with I don't know part politicians or how they call it, local barons, that's what we call here, Motri, they call it, uh, they, they call it local barons there. So, uh, uh, of course, they have a long way to go, but, but again, the trend is there, and uh, so I think there's actually a great future. What about France? Is that going in the right direction as well? We just had elections. I think that France is a very interesting country and extremely
extremely challenging society for an analyst because they are in many situations they are flagging in advance situation which might become a European problem later on. Uh, France was uh, uh, not happy with the constitutional text for European integration process. Uh, France was uh, uh, in, in many times uh, really in outposts of, uh, of European history, you know, uh, also in, in, in current times. So I think that it's very interesting to, to follow the situation in France because all those challenges are not only theirs, they are ours. Uh, and uh, we have to be aware of that, otherwise uh, we would uh, create a situation that might reproduce uh, very dangerous situations also in our own vicinity and in our society. We are so interlinked that we have to pay attention and, uh, and to help to address the different challenges of current times. There seems to be quite a lot of mistrust of France in this country. I think it happens again and again, politically. I don't think so. Uh, uh, what is maybe a great challenge currently is that uh, we uh, have a lack of information. Uh, the budgetary cuts in different dailies and media outlets produced a situation that you have not anymore in major capitals of the world. People who help you to understand the situation there, frame it, analyze it, make it um, uh, accessible. So for a diplomat, it's a challenging situation because you do not have a partner. And you are facing only the challenge of internet, which is very rapid, which is not precise enough, which is very emotional and very schematic. And this is something uh, really which can harm to understanding of different uh, uh, societies and nations. So I think that there is a challenge, uh, which is much more uh, broader and much more general. For instance, the biggest TV uh, uh, chain in France uh, uh, has uh, uh, barely one journalist in Brussels. So you can imagine how uh, weak is uh, the coverage of issues which are decided for us either in European Parliament, European Commission, European Council. One journalist cannot cope with this. And the procedures are extremely complex. If you go to lobbyist groups, think tanks, distinguished political parties and so on, this is the problem. We have a feeling that we are interconnected, but the quality of this interconnection is very, very poor. We need good journalists, we have to pay uh, for this as readers, and uh, uh, otherwise we will just simply uh, dissociate. Would you like to add something? Big protests. There were like 
small groups of some communist uh, member, a uh, communist party uh, members, and it's just totally incomparable to the, the number of people who are actually welcoming them. But, but again, uh, as I said, I am a, I'm a little bit. Uh, I'm not sure if I didn't lost some kind of a touch with reality in the Czech Republic. After so I mean, there, 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 are, there are members of, of your boss's party who have been saying some quite strange things. Mm. Well, <laughs> and you want me to comment? Uh, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just, uh, I'm just sort of, I've got three dots at the end of my sentence. You can either comment or, or not. I, I think that in the light of, of this debate, in, during which we speak about Vatsavada and his legacy, your question has uh, all the sense. Because he was a very outspoken uh, uh, advocate of uh, our membership in NATO. He was very much outspoken as the voice in favor of enlarging NATO, not as a space of military posture, but as a space of democracy, a rule of law, and common destiny, and shared responsibility. And I think that, uh, unfortunately enough, our politicians uh, who share uh, this vision are not um, uh, so visible. Maybe this is a fault of media, uh, but uh, I would uh, really very much appreciate that uh, uh, we can uh, speak about this also in those terms. I remember when we uh, prepared NATO summit in Prague, Václav uh, Havel paid a special attention to many almost minor staging issues. It was almost frustrating for us to see how uh, detailed his approach to this event was. But when he started to speak, you saw how bold his political stand uh, uh, was in terms of message and of engagement. And I think that this is our part of our legacy, which we as citizens and also uh, political parties should uh, uh, be more uh, aware of, about. Because otherwise we are just living in a very special uh, talk show. Uh, uh, but uh, this is a matter of concern if you consider that Europe is challenged on the east and on the south by two very important conflicts we are, um, uh, uh, we are challenged with. So I think that uh, uh, this question, and thank you for this, is much more serious than, than only we could, uh, uh, we could distinguish from different statements. In Russia, people do genuinely seem to be frightened of NATO. It seems to be one of the best messages that has come out of the, 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 uh, the, the la events of the last couple of years, that, 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 that people in Western Europe have been surprised they really do seem to be scared of us. That's true, isn't it? Why? I think that for a political leader, a dream is to have a large public support. Uh, because you can have a circle of sympathies and a strength to promote even things which are not very popular. And if I observe the support uh, Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin has at home, uh, it is a dream. He is more than 80% of public opinion polls. In my reading, there is a correlation between the war or between the very sharp criticism of NATO and reproducing of some fascist-like uh, uh, narrative linked to the Second World War we uh, hear from some Russian media because people are just scared or, uh, or fearful but it is a construct helping to solidify the power and the, the verticality of power and nothing less. If you observe how many uh, opinion polls uh, gained Bibi Netanyahu during uh, the military operation in Gaza, you see similar process. So we have to be aware of this logic and in order to 
to fight, to be ready to fight, you had to create an enemy. Uh, there was a sociologist in France who wrote a, a very interesting book about creation of enemy. And this is very, uh, maybe, important to recall. <coughs> Very interesting. Maybe I would just ask you, you've used this word legacy a couple times in, in using Havel's legacy. Um, and, and what I see is that, in fact, it seems that the, the ministry now is kind of moving away from a lot of the things that Havel had done in the past and, and some of these things. And, and so what I'm curious about is actually not to put you on the spot, um, but to ask to what extent, and I, and I guess I should say as well that I can understand that people want to do something different, to, to move in new directions. And yet Havel, of course, is a global figure and is really, uh, I can see how using Havel is somehow useful in diplomatic ways. And so what I'm interested in is whether it's considered acceptable, I don't know what the word may be, useful or proper to use Havel's legacy. And is there some kind of diplomatically acceptable way that that's done? Is, is, does the diplomatic academy or does, does the ministry provide a, a sort of way of doing that or they encourage a way of doing that? Or is this something that, that the country is just moving away from? I think that the country cannot move away. Uh, uh, fortunately, enough country has to stay and to stick to some of its past. If you travel as a Czech diplomat worldwide, you meet a lot of people who cannot even address your own country in current terms. And you are introduced as Czechoslovak. Ambassador. And this is the situation. We live with our past and we have to prepare our future. And uh, Václav Havel is a very important card to play with. You cannot just hide it. This might be a mistake, a big error, if you hide it. But speaking about legacy, uh, there is a tricky situation in political parties, for instance. Václav Havel doesn't have a legacy in a political party in the parliament. His care about constitution here and the rule of law, we do not see uh, uh, someone who takes this legacy. His, his uh, attention paid to, to the countryside, you do not see politicians paying attention to this. So he has uh, this advantage of being public person so many years that you have the choice. Uh, and you can be embarrassed by the, uh, the richness of choice. It would be a mistake, in my view, if you just hide all those cards and you say we are living in 21st century. It is not right, because expectations worldwide are tuned that you speak about Havel, that you speak about Masaryk. You cannot just erase it and it should be a real error doing so. And if I observe or follow our Highest politicians, uh, when they address different fora, they speak about Havel. Yeah, I just uh, wanted also to underline this. I mean, it's not so long ago when when uh, uh, the prime minister, uh, foreign minister, and the speaker of the uh, chamber of representatives uh, visited uh, Washington D.C. and. Uh, participated in this uh, animalic ceremony of Havel's bus there, so I think that that's, uh, they, uh, they do that. Uh, uh, it's true there was a discussion within the foreign uh, ministry about, specifically about the human rights uh, promotion. Uh, it is not right now immediately what I am uh, doing. I am dealing with the issues of uh, Hogal's legacy and anti-Semitism and uh, thanks, God, thanks God it's not controversial. Uh, so, <laughs> but uh, regarding the human rights uh, promotion, I think that that uh, uh, you know there was all these working papers which are really widely quoted and and uh, commented on and. I think that, that uh, also after this uh, debate, uh, what I, from what I understand, because I'm not dealing directly with this issue now, the uh, situation developed a little bit and, and uh, uh, we, uh, there is 
the new concept of the foreign policy, uh, which is uh, being discussed now, uh, it uh, still has the human rights promotion as one of the anchors of the Czech uh, foreign policy, maybe a little bit uh, uh, different, slightly different focuses, but the change is not so dramatic uh, as it looked uh, from the uh, discussion a couple of months ago. Yeah. Uh, well, it, it, well it, the papers are important, I don't underestimate it, because they, are, they formulate, you formulate thoughts. <laughs> uh, there, but the papers are uh, also changed a little bit. Other questions? Yes. Speaking of changing papers, um, and going back to this concept of artificiality, um, and perhaps maybe not so much talking about sanctions, but taking some actions towards countries that are not as democratic or are dictatorships. I come from a country called Azerbaijan, uh -huh. where there is a dictatorship and we have over 90 political prisoners. Um, and yet, uh, when you look at Azerbaijani presence here in this country, with the legacy of Václav Havel, there are you know, certain mentions that belong to our politicians, and there is sort of this uh, discrepancy in a way. And on our side of, of journalists and activists and civil society in Azerbaijan, so, so how does it fit into this bigger picture of a country that, you know, has this legacy and yet kind of deals with these kind of issues or doesn't deal with these issues or closes its eyes to these issues. So just uh, again, sorry, I'm not, not dealing with uh, Azerbaijan, so I'm not, not uh, in this particular issue. I don't feel uh, like the right person to answer, but you mentioned something about them having mentions here, or uh, I don't know. Properties, big yeah. properties. Mm. And they are illegally acquired or from illegal money, or? Well, if you're talking about our ministers buying property here, it's uh -huh. slightly, that involves corruption and not the legal money that they buy these properties with, so. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I, I, well, uh, I think that everybody can buy property here, so it's like uh, I, probably they don't buy it just in the Czech Republic, but all over the European Union, I assume. So no, they it, don't, uh, actually. Huh? They don't. I live in Denmark, and you cannot buy property like Russians buy here. You cannot do that. Uh, how Not even it? people from the European Union uh -huh. can buy property in Denmark. You have to live in Denmark. So the rules are not equal, so I have to understand. You have to live question. in Denmark to buy a property there. Is it yes, and then is if it you are, So it's illegal yes. for me as a citizen of the European Union. Yeah, you cannot Union from here as a Czech Denmark. buy property in Denmark. You if you're a citizen of the European Union. Exactly. Then, then my rights would be harmed. So, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I would protest against it. <laughs> it, it, would, it would be worth nothing, you know. But it's, it's an interesting, actually, but I mean, they do that because of I this. think it would be illegal not to, to, to do that, what you say. <laughs> <laughs> no, they are protecting, they are protecting, and uh, things are protecting their territory, and that's what I mean, yeah. you say. Also, I, mean, I, I must defend uh, my profession, yeah. because I've had a lot of attacks on journalists uh, in the last uh, half hour or so, which I've kept quiet about. Mm -hmm. But I have to say that... Uh, a couple of the Czech papers, Respect in particular, have actually drawn attention to the plight of um, prisoners of conscience in Azerbaijan, which is more than the um, foreign ministry has done. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I mean, uh, the awkward, <laughs> my profession. Awkward, <laughs> awkward situation of uh, Find something that I absolutely yeah, know about. Well, I mean, it's, 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 <laughs> so, it's not which I admit. Yeah. Uh, honestly, as I said, I came back from Romania a couple of weeks ago, and, yeah. and I'm dealing with totally different uh, issues than this. But, uh, but uh, well, I have no doubt that Azerbaijan is a dictatorship, <laughs> and, and uh, uh, I have no doubt that there are political. I have no doubt uh, we have to uh, stand behind them. How far we are doing it and not doing it, I simply don't know. The gentleman had a question. Uh, yeah, uh, um, I just wanted to, to come back to the question of uh, allegedly uh, going 
going away from the legacy of Vassal Hagel in terms of uh, human rights, uh, because actually I'm a member of the uh, Czech Foreign Service as well. Uh, this, I think it's a very crucial question and uh, in my view as I see it, it's uh, really as uh, Jiří said that uh, there is uh, maybe a misunderstanding uh, based on uh, some uh, uh, discussion, but a discussion led by officials rather than by politicians. Because if you see the, uh, the uh, if you, 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 see, you see the statements of the politicians of the of the ruling party or the social democrat party of, of the government, uh, there is uh, no uh, no uh, no doubt about it. Yes. So there is. Uh, the question of uh, the new concept of the Czech foreign policy uh, uh, keeps the, uh, the, uh, uh, the weight of uh, human rights uh, in the same way like in the past, only having it in a, in a link linked with the term of human dignity. There is, a, there is a discussion about, uh, about what, what you understand under the term of human dignity. Yes, it's, uh, but it is linked, interlinked with the human rights. This is the only shift which made it, makes it a little bit broader and which makes the discussion uh, about it possible even with those who, are not, uh, who do not agree with our, uh, our notion of human rights. How, how do you explain someone that's somebody like the Slovak Prime Minister, Robert Fico, whose, whose rhetoric is fairly pro Putin, but whose policy is strongly anti Putin? Uh, Robert Fico? Fico? Yes, in Slovakia. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what for any of you, really. It's an, it, it seems to be. I don't know. A, we have the same thing in this. I don't know. Okay, but I probably won't get to. Talk about it, but in the in the Social Democratic Party here as well, there's a there's a there are, there's a lot of uh, inconsistency between what is often said and what is what my policy. If you observe uh, our political parties, they are mainly very weak in terms of numbers and in terms of expertise, and it uh, helps uh, to uh, promote voices which are not so significant and important but which receive the floor and they can be reproduced. So this is the case. I think that our um, uh, perspective is sometimes biased uh, and we read voices which are not in the, as a whole so important but you are attracted because they are just out of the box completely maybe out of the agenda sometimes, but you have to remind that we had also this uh, congressional activity within two important government parties. Maybe it will calm down now, we shall see, because there is a third one which uh, is about to organize its congress. Basically, foreign policy issues are not those who challenge uh, the governors here or decide elections. Are there any other questions? I think it's up to you. I can follow Czech media for quite some time. <laughs> you can answer about the Romanian. <laughs> I do not know if I understand well the question. What is the challenge for Czech media or of Czech media in both? More specifically, I'm curious about what the strengths and weaknesses are in Czech media in representing Czech interests, both internally and I'm not sure if the role of Czech media is to represent Czech interests. I would be happy that there is something more um, in terms of, uh, for instance, 
reality, reality check from the uh, field or from regions we are uh, interested about. Uh, but uh, I hope that I'm replying well on your question. My second point would be I am very much happy with the, the, the doings of Czech Press Agency, Czech Public Radio, Czech TV, which, are, which have a very good sense of public service and if you see that they are operating rather with a very open-minded approach and we need it desperately because of uh, the flow of information. And third, uh, in press I see some kind of emancipation of some outlets from big money uh, and big influence of big companies. So I think that uh, we have signs of hope and we have to, uh, to encourage uh, those uh, tendencies. Could, maybe before we finish, did you want to say something? Before we finish, uh, we've been awfully mean on you, we've bombarded you with questions which are outside your field and also which you can't really answer as a serving diplomat. But there is one question which you can answer. I'm, I, could you, because you've just literally just taken up your new job as the Czech envoy for Holocaust and anti-Semitism issues, I would like to ask you about that job, both because of the question of pensions and compensation for Holocaust survivors, and also the fact that there is very manifest in Europe at the moment a, an increase in both anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. Uh, well, this is a job which somehow it was always somebody in the foreign ministry who took care of the uh, issue actually uh, many years ago in uh, 1999. I was the first one uh, to, to be appointed at that time. It was called Ambassador at Large to deal with the legacy of Second World War. It was named like that. Now it's a special envoy for Holocaust uh, and anti Semitism, but it's, it's practically the same, uh, same uh, job. Uh, so it, it has um, several let's say, dimensions. One of them is uh, representing the Czech Republic abroad because we are part of the, the different international task force, which uh, the role of which is uh, to um, educate about uh, what happened, uh, because we have the last generation of survivors here, and somehow to, to make sure that this uh, kind of uh, memory uh, is maintained also in the next uh, generations. And the other dimension is just to take care somehow of the survivors who are still among us. So uh, in the Czech Republic there is still about uh, 1,200 uh, of uh, concentration camp survivors. They are, of course, around 90 years old, all of them, and about 15 or 20,000 former forced uh, laborers. So uh, it's still a significant uh, group of people. There are also still 1,200 World War II uh, veterans, but this is, this is uh, the Ministry of uh, Defense job, so it's just uh, they are also all in their 90s. So. Uh, but they are still among us and uh, they have special uh, needs in uh, healthcare, uh, social care. So, uh, of course, this is a matter mainly for our Ministry of uh, so Social Affairs and Labour. But uh, uh, my role would be also to interlink with, uh, with the international community because maybe they have some projects and programs which uh, have proven to, uh, to be effective and to work well and uh, so maybe we can uh, transfer them here uh, and uh, also a, co co a conference coming up in six weeks time in fact. Yes, we have a conference uh, in here in Prague, international conference about welfare for uh, Nazi uh, victims and Holocaust victims and other uh, victims of Nazi persecution will be by the end of uh, May here in, in, in uh, Prague. And also there are like uh, different sources, let's say, of uh, financial or other help for Czech citizens, so survivors from abroad, not only from our government, but still there are some pensions from 
Germany and, and uh, maybe so we can help to... You mean from the private sector? No, there are also uh, still uh, German governmental uh, programs. Actually, there is a uh, new amended legislation which uh, is specifically for the survivors of ghettos and uh, there are still some survivors of ghettos, uh, Jewish but also for instance Roma on our territory and we somehow try to advise them how to, uh, how to apply for these benefits. And so, it's, uh, so it's a combination of very practical assistance from the victims with uh, uh, education. And, uh, there it's is nice and not controversial, as you said, is it? <laughs> uh, yeah, but it's useful. And, uh, it's, it's kind of uh, something, uh, kind of rewarding to do something that makes sense. And uh, which you don't do always in the foreign ministry. And um, there is a, sadly a new element of this, which seems to be more and more, uh, again, I, I think, on, on, on agenda, which is anti-Semitism, which seems to not to be a problem in Europe anymore. Uh, in the last years, but it's somehow coming back. So, in this country, it hasn't. There haven't, there haven't been many scientific groups so far. Have there? I mean, in recent um, years. No, uh, I mean still uh, in like international comparisons because I don't know American Jewish committee they made all these uh, polls in, in European countries. So, in that uh, context. Uh, doesn't seem to be a major problem in the Czech Republic, but uh, again, it might come. And sometimes you follow uh, all these, uh, you know, there are like these uh, strange news servers and yes. some people who look kind of marginal, but they are somehow more and more uh, visible. Uh, you never know, you know, what, what becomes uh, out of it. Before we put an hour and three quarters, which is quite a long time. So I don't know whether we'd like to say anything in conclusion. In that case, thank you very much for all of you for the comments. Thank you, Bob, for our two guests, Peter Schiffler and Donald Fisher, for joining us. So this refreshment was some wine, I believe. So, and I'm talking.